pages to fill in for the year of your activities, of your thoughts, of what is going on in your life. And as Ecclesiastes tells us, there's a time for everything and a season for everything. So as I go through this, I want you to keep this thought in mind. How am I filling in the pages of my book? As a small girl growing up, I had no concept of time. Who thought about time? Time when the, you know, the birds started coming into the chimney at night, that's when we knew we had to come inside. I thought I was gonna live forever, or at least until I had white hair, was teaching adult Sunday school, singing in the choir, having families come over and join me at my large table in my quaint little home. That was old age for me. I had a life plan in my head like many of us do. I'm gonna graduate from high school, I'm gonna graduate from college, I'm gonna get a good job, I'm gonna get married, raise a family, be successful in my career, retire, travel, and then when my time was called by the Heavenly Father, I would cross over. In this life plan, did I really understand the death? Did I really understand that my time would end? I made those milestones along my life plan, not always in the order that I thought they would be, but I made them. Some of them I didn't. There was consequences. There was sadness. There was things that I didn't want to write down in my book. Sometimes I was so busy with my life, I didn't have time to think about what Jesus was doing in my life. So my pages were blank because I just didn't have time. I didn't have time to pray. I didn't have time to do my Bible study. I had life to live. So those pages are blank. It's not that I didn't do anything. I just did not put Christ first. In 1992, I found myself divorced. That was not in my life plan. All of a sudden, I was a single career mom with one child. This is different, but with my Christian upbringing, the example of loving and raising a family from my parents and my grandparents, I took the bull by the horn and I went full steam ahead. I had a son to raise and I was going to make sure that he had the best life that I could provide. My son and I did okay. We had a good home. We were involved in church and school activities. Every spring break and summer, he and I went on a vacation. We even went camping like Daniel Boone down in Kentucky. <laughs> My son became the highlight of the campground because people were amazed that this single mom and this little redheaded guy were camping. We loved it and it was one of our best memories. And that's what we kept filling our book pages with, is these memories of the good times. Watching my son go through Sunday school, watching him become a confirmand and be a member of the United Methodist Church, watching him graduate. Those were the pages of my book that I was filling. But suddenly in 2001, my life pages became dark. I found myself ill and no real reason and doctors could not give me a diagnosis. I wanted a word. I wanted a word to put in my book that says, this is why you don't feel good. So we began a series of tests, medical test after medical test, doctors, specialists, hospitalizations, prescription medications over and over and over. I was no longer that single career mom divorced. I was a disabled single divorced mom. 
I qualified for one of those blue and white hangers with the wheelchair that you hang on your wheelchair or on your mirror. I was in my 40s. You don't have one of those on there. I didn't have time to be disabled. I didn't want to be disabled. I had to provide for my son. One day my pastor came to visit me at home as I was struggling with this new life. And as we were ending it in prayer, her prayer was this, dear Lord, enough. She was right, I had enough. I had enough of this illness, I had enough of this change that was happening in my life. It was enough. Lord, you were testing me enough to stop. Show me what I'm doing wrong and make me whole. I realize that with this disability and with the doctors, this was going to be my life. I went through and I got all those important legal documents. I had my will done. I had papers that said what was going to happen to my son for his well-being and his future. I had my power of attorney. I had my medical directives that said, do not resuscitate. When it's my time to go, let me go. I had those very difficult conversations with my loved ones, telling them, when it's my time, let me go. Time ticked on. Days became weeks, weeks became months, months became years. Lord, are you not hearing me? I'm tired of being sick. My faith was crumbling. I was not willing to accept the doctors that said, you're not gonna be able to work again. I had to provide for my son. I've been known over the years to be independent. I'm the only girl, I have three brothers, which by far makes me the best and the, the most specialist. Um, I'm a bit obstinate at times. And I'm stubborn. So I decided, if I can't work full time in business management, which I had been doing, if I cannot do those long hours and that intense stress that came with that, there had to be something I could do. So what does every disabled, divorced, single mom do? I went back to college. I thought, I'm gonna get me a degree in something that I can do part-time. It's gonna be less intense. And I wanted to do something to make a difference. So I graduated from Tri-State University, now known as Trine University in Angola, Indiana, with a degree in social sciences. And I started working as a family rehabilitation person. I worked with families where a Department of Children's Services named DCS would come in and remove children from the homes. My job was to work with these families, reconcile them if I could, so that the parents and children could live in a healthy, safe, productive home. There were also times when that was not what needed to happen. Sometimes those parental rights needed to be removed. And I then worked on helping place these children in a safe, adoptive family. It was tough. It was tough but I knew I was doing something good and I was feeling that the Lord was finally back with me. He was guiding me through this. He was helping me work with these families that is so difficult because they're dependent upon someone with alcohol, drugs, abuse, neglect, and so many other words that can describe what those homes were like. The one common factor in most of those homes is Jesus was missing. Working in this thing, I could not introduce them to God. But I had a chance by my example of how I was living 
to bring a little bit of that light into their homes. While I was working, sometimes I had really good days and I could work with no problem. It was a roller coaster for me. Other times it was so difficult for me to even get out of my bed. But I had a son who was going through school. We were going through middle school and high school and into college. I couldn't give up, even at those times I wanted to. December of 2018 rolls around. I'm at a nephew's wedding, beautiful. I'm with my family. I became ill, I developed a headache that encompassed this whole right side of my face. My arm became numb, my right side became weak, and I had a stroke. Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> Wanna talk about the conversation the Lord and I had then? Mm-hmm. I told him, uh, I'm in my 40s. Matter of fact, Lord, I just turned 50. You cannot be saying I had a stroke. I was at a wedding. I was rejoicing. It was my time to dance with my family. It was my time to celebrate. And you allow me to have a stroke. I went through rehabilitation. This country is so blessed, and particularly this state, with Mary Free Bed Rehabilitation in Grand Rapids. Because I walked out of there. I had no residual effects, meaning I had nothing wrong. But I had a headache, a chronic migraine headache that stayed with me, decided this is a good place to live. <laughs> These migraine headaches, there were days I had difficulty finding my words. And let me tell you, for a little girl who has never stopped talking, that was tough. For my family and loved ones who had to listen to me try to find those words. My dad can do a pretty good imitation of me. I don't know how I was talking. I just know it was hard. I did not know why the Lord. He gave me back everything else after the stroke. Why did you have to leave the headache? I would be driving on my job because I still was continuing to try to work and I'd get lost. If you've ever been in northern Indiana, we have a lot of those black buggies with horses. And I love driving through that part of the country. But there were times I didn't know where I was going. So I didn't know if I was going to work, if I was coming home. I didn't know. I had times when I didn't even know my loved ones, when I didn't know their voice, or I didn't even know them when I saw them. I had no faith. I was so mad at God. You can take away a lot, but don't take away my ability to know my loved ones. I know it says in 1 Peter 5.10, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. <laughs> wow, where was that God that Peter was describing? He was not in my life. I wasn't sick a little while. I'd been sick for years. God was not with me. My dad became my Meals and Wheels. My mom cooked for three instead of two. 
being the oldest of 12, that lady knows how to cook for big numbers. You want a recipe from my mom for 100? She can work it out for you. So my dad was my meals on wheels. I no longer could drive, which meant I no longer could work. My time of getting to church, oh, I would make the plans on Saturday night and tell my mom and dad, yeah, I want to go to church. I missed my church family. But then I'd wake up on Sunday mornings, and many, many times that wasn't happening. I stopped praying. My Bible went on the shelf to collect dust. God had no time for me. I had no time for him. He was not welcomed into my home. I wanted to put nothing in my life book that I was given year after year because I didn't want to have a memory of this. I just wanted the Lord to take me and let me just be rid of this. We've now gone into the year of 2016. I'm given a new book. Woohoo! Happy New Year! I began suffering with severe dizziness. I still had all these other diagnoses. So now we have to add one more. Oh, let's give some more medicine. Let's send her back to therapy. So I started doing physical and vision therapy because I've now been diagnosed with a vestibular problem. A vestibular problem means your eyes don't track, meaning I couldn't read because I couldn't get my eyes to go like this. If I'd got stopped by law enforcement and they put that pen up in front of me, follow the pen, <laughs> couldn't do it. My nephew, who's a police officer, said, Aunt Beth, get a letter from your doctor that says why you can't do this. Seriously, they have letters that tells the cops that if you're gonna stop me because you think I'm drunk or I'm on drugs, that says, this is why. She's got a vestibular problem. <laughs> okay, Rob, I'll get the letter. And my doctors were not surprised that I asked because they do this. This physical and vision therapy was tough. And there were one time in particular when I'm sitting on one of the therapy tables and the therapist is working with me and my dad was in there and I just started crying. I can't do this. I can't do this. He told me to pull up my bootstraps. Nothing had beat me yet. And I wasn't going to let this one get me. I came home that night. And I went to lay down in my bed. Now, my bed is a very, very special bed. I know all of us love our beds. Mine is a solid maple canopy bed that I bought with my babysitting money when I was 13 years old. And I lay down in my bed, and I've got my canopy over my head, and the room is spinning. And I begged the Lord, to end this. I was so tired. And I was hurting inside so bad because my family and loved ones were watching me just go down, go down. Whether you call it I had a spell, whether you would call it that, you know, I was declining. I was tired. But I apologized to God and I said, I'm sorry, I've hated you. If I say I'm sorry, will you stop this? Will you make this right again? I've been punished enough. I fell asleep and my days started all over again the same. 
July 24th of 2016, I was preparing myself for bed. And my nighttime routine was I went over to my island in my kitchen and I took my 11 nighttime medications, one bottle after another. As I was standing there at my island, I recall becoming very shaky. I don't remember anything else. It's here where I should turn this over to my parents. Because after 20 some hours, they came in to check on me because nobody had seen me or heard from me. I wasn't on Facebook, I wasn't texting, I wasn't making calls. I was silent. It was my time to be silent. I was unconscious, unresponsive, laying on the floor. Although I had those directives that said, do not resuscitate, do not use artificial means to keep me going, the love between a parent and a child cannot be on a piece of paper. And my parents called for help. I was life flighted from my home to Parkview Regional Hospital in Fort Wayne, Indiana. My parents were given the diagnosis of a brainstem stroke. And a brainstem stroke can just debilitate you and can also take your life. And they were told she's probably not going to make it. My son and my brothers were called in. I was lying in ICU, dependent upon medical procedures to keep me going. In those paperwork that I had done, the directive that said, do not keep me going on artificial items. My son did a selfless, loving, very difficult thing. At 27 years of age, he signed the paper that says, take my mom off and move her to hospice. And I thank him, and I continually thank him for following my wishes. I was moved into hospice. And in hospice, they're there to keep you comfortable and sedated. I began my rest for my final days. I'd had my time to live, and now it was my time to die. On August 1st of 2016, my brother David, who's a United Methodist minister in Cincinnati, Ohio, posted on social media this statement. My sister Beth is dying. It's hard to say, but it is true. It's less difficult to say because I know that death is not the final word. Furthermore, Beth knows the same. At her bedside, we just prayed a bit of scripture from Romans 8, 35 to 39. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble, suffering, hard times or hunger, nakedness or danger or death? In everything, we have won more than a victory because of Christ who loves us. Nothing separates us from God's love, not life or death, not angels or spirits, not the present or the future, and not powers above or powers below. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He ended it by saying, and so we rest, and so she shall soon rest. Thanks be to God. My family and friends sat beside my bed in hospice as time ticked by, minute by minute, day by day, week by week. On one of those days, my pastor was sitting with my family and they were planning my celebration of life service. The pastor asked my family if I had a favorite scripture. I recall 
that I rolled over in my hospice bed and I told him, Ecclesiastes 3. Now just kind of think about this. If you haven't been talking or doing anything for a while and you were going to say a book of the Bible, wouldn't you say like Mark, John, something simple? No, my life scripture is Ecclesiastes. I rolled back over and went to sleep. My family is saying or thinking, is this the good before she passes on? Is this a sign that she's coming back? My family wondered and prayed. I slept. On August 9th of 2016, I woke up. There's this nurse in my face. She's telling me she's adjusting my oxygen tube. Well, take it off. I don't need it. In all the times I'd been in the hospital, I was never dependent upon oxygen, and I don't know why I am now, so take it off. There becomes the obstinate, stubborn Beth again. She said she couldn't. Well, now I'm not liking her. And as she walks away, I proceed to tell her I don't like the scrubs you're wearing. And the picture that I recall of what that scene was is she had this pink scrub top with a black stripe under the arm, and she had black pants on with a pink stripe down the side. It didn't match. <laughs> Just did not match. She chuckled at me, and she said, it's good to see your blue eyes sparkle. And I did not know why she said that. Don't my blue eyes always sparkle? She left the room and my parents entered, one on each side of my bed. And the brief little moment of a picture that I have in my mind is kind of a surprised look. My mom asked me, do you know where you're at? Kind of looking around, and I see that hospital mug that says Parkview. And I said, yeah, Parkview Hospital. <laughs> That's no big deal. I'd been there many, many times. I'd been in the old hospital. I had been in the new hospital. Being at the hospital was no big deal. And then my parents told me I had been really, really sick. But I didn't understand because I don't know, I don't remember. I don't even know what day it is. Time kind of blends and blurs and stuff for the next 24 hours. There was conversation that I was going to have to get moved to a different room. Okay. Well, they put me in this different room, and this room is hot. And I wanted it cold. That independent person began complaining. Then there was talk about me moving to a rehabilitation center. Okay, <laughs> done this seven times. <laughs> What's new? This is no big deal. This was my normal hospital discharge. The following day, ambulance arrives from Angola, Indiana and they take me to Lakeland Skilled Nursing Rehabilitation Center. Okay, been there before. Been there, done that. There were a few things that I was recognizing that was different. I did feel different, but I hadn't been able to pinpoint what really was different. While I was in Lakeland, the first few days, therapist comes in to assess me to see where do they need to begin work. It's okay. I've had these assessments before. I've even had this therapist before. So she and my brother assist me to getting to the side of my bed, and the therapist says we're going to stand. Well, you know, the Lord has ways to protect us in our mind and in our heart of 
things that are happening. And while this, I'm getting set up to stand up, my mind kept thinking, oh my God, this is when I find out I'm paralyzed. That had always been my fear after seven strokes, that I was not going to bounce back, that I was going to find out that there was permanent damage. I'm begging deep in my mind, God, don't take away my walking ability. As I was in this conversation with the same Lord that I had denied and I had turned away from, and I had said, I don't need you, I needed him, and I needed him to hear what I needed. I soon felt a tap on my cheek, and it was kind of, okay, and I turned and my therapist says, you can sit down, you've been standing for three minutes. I turned and looked to my brother David who was sitting in a chair right there by where I was at. There were tears down his face. I was standing. I had laid for over three weeks, not moving, not eating, not talking, basically not doing much. But I was standing. Jesus was there for me. Because he took my thoughts away from my weakness. So I was not concentrating on the bad, but I was in conversation with him where God was saying, we got this, we've got this. My team of therapists were physical, occupational, speech and vision, and they began working with me to restart a new life. It was not January 1st, it was August, but I was saying Happy New Year, Happy New Life. The sky was the limit because we didn't know what I could do or what I couldn't do. I might be able to do things better than I'd done before. We did not know. In the past when I had my strokes and I would go to rehab, we always worked with the weak side, which was always my right side. This time we're working with my body because I was weak from the top of my head to the bottoms of my feet. But I was determined. Oh, I was determined that I was going to be better than ever. My pages of my new life book were going to be bright and beautiful. There were no more dark pages for me. In that determination and that stubbornness that I had, I was determined I was going home to my house on the lake. And this was difficult for some of my family that were further away, and they were not seeing the day-to-day -day progress that my parents, when they came down, that they could see. And part of my family was saying, she needs to stay at the nursing home. <laughs> Remember I said I'm the only girl with three brothers? When my brothers told me I couldn't do something, by golly, I gave everything I had to prove to them that they were wrong. And I became really obstinate, and I became even more determined that I was going to prove to my brothers I was going home to my house on the lake. Through this process, I was slowly beginning to understand the medical crisis that I was in. To this day, we don't know exactly what happened. We don't have that medical word. Those words that I was looking so much forward to try to find out what was wrong with me, I don't have a word to say why I'm right. But the one thing we do know is the longer that I was off all of those prescription medications, 
the better I became. For us believers, what happened was not a medical intervention. It was a miracle. Because my God had not left me. Even though I was turning my back and I was leaving him, he never left me. Because he knew the timeline. It was in his time, not mine. And that is so difficult, even now, to remember it's his time and it's his plan. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, for I know the plans for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That, my folks, has become a very, very important scripture for me because it was in his time that he was planning, it was in his time that he put the hope and planned my future. I did move back to my home on the lake. I got there in time that I could still mow. <laughs> I was there for the fall and dealt with the leaves. I was there in the winter and I proudly shoveled my back deck in my driveway because I now have a car and I'm driving again. The Lord had brought me home to my physical home because he said, I'm not ready for you in your earthly home. Although there were so many times that I was begging him, I even threw in the lines, but grandma and grandpa need me. I need to be with my grandparents. That didn't work because God knew when that was gonna happen. In the spring of 2017, I'm in my house, and one of the things that had transformed in my life besides my faith was I no longer had my migraine headaches. That day in rehab, when my mom just said, how's the headache? Wow. I had no headache. I didn't have the buzzing in my ears. And my son will tell you, I used to have the volume on my TV really loud because I had to overcome this buzzing in my ears. And now he comes to my house and he's going, Mom, can you turn that up a little bit? Yes, Jesus, I sure will turn that up because I know I'm turning it up because the Lord took away that excess noise. But as I was looking at my house, and it had been a brand new house at one point, 15 years later of neglect because taking care of my home was not a priority. It wasn't on my radar of to-do. My radar was survival. Suffering, a lot of feeling sorry for myself. So now I'm looking with a clear mind and clear eyes. Wow, there's a lot that's gotta be done here. Now it also helped a little bit that when I was in hospice, my family was preparing my house to sell. So they had removed a lot of things in my house through a sale, which opened up my walls, opened up my floor, and I was beginning to see things needed to improve. And I said, I don't wanna do it. I don't wanna to try to find the money for this because I am still on social security disability and I am not working to have a second income. So I put my little house on the lake for sale, put it on sale in April and July, the middle of July, I moved. And I moved into an apartment complex for 55 and better. hit me really well because I was 55 and better. That first year after my collapse, my health status according to the medical professionals was fragile. Because we did not know what was gonna be my new normal. We did not know what my baseline was. 
I am happy to announce, three years later, I'm good. <laughs> I have two doctors that I see twice a year. I was doing 13 doctors before. My address book and my phone opened up when I started going through and deleting all of those specialists that I no longer needed to see. I'm not supporting the pharmaceutical companies like I was. I was one of their favorites. I go in once a month and I get my two small medications. Because even with everything that I've gone through, the Lord decided, Beth, I've got to keep you humble. I can't take away all of your ailments. I got to keep you to where you recognize, yeah, I'm okay, but I still need the Lord to help me. So I have what they call fibromyalgia. That's the term gets thrown out, but I have a body ache. That's all right. When I get the smallest little headache, I start to panic. Oh, Lord, do not bring these migraines back. And all it takes is one phone call to my dad and saying, I got a headache. And he goes, okay, how's the rest of you? Well, I'm okay. All right, fine, let it go. So simple. But it took my mind off of thinking about my headache. Because when we sit and dwell on the bad, it slowly starts to consume us. I'm happy to say I've been able to go back to work. And I went somewhere completely different than what I'd done before. I'm not in management. I'm not in the social work. I'm considered a ranger at Pokagon State Park in Angola, Indiana. I work in the office. I wear my uniform three days a week. And I come home and praise the Lord because I can do this. The Lord has guided me to take on some different leaderships within my church. And I go to the Coldwater United Methodist Church in Coldwater, Michigan. I've become a conference trainer for the entire state of Michigan for the United Methodist Church in the abuse prevention policy training. I go into churches and tell them and help them have a safe church for our children, our youth, and our vulnerable adults. I've taken this gift that the Lord gave me of being able to talk, and I'm now a certified lay speaker for United Methodist Church, that I not only can go and share my testimony and my story, but he has also been guiding me to fill the pulpit and to bring his word to them. I'm vice president of our United Methodist Women. And one of the things I want to point out on that is, as a girl, and I'm going to hit the, the women, do you remember ever growing up and saying, oh, I do not want to be like my mother? OK? Well, I'm like my mother. I'm vice president. I think I just heard my dad say amen to that. <laughs> Okay, but my mother had served for many, many years on the church, our local church level, on the district, and on the conference level. So at 61 years of age, I'm proud to say I'm like my mom. Okay, I may not be able to do pies as good as her, but that's okay. My Bible is no longer covered with dust. You oftentimes will find my Bible covered with paper and pencil as I am studying the word and I'm making my notes. I have a new saying that I live by, do good, love God, and do no harm. And that is what I try to show my life goal as being, and that's what I try to show to the people who I have connected through the various things I do. The butterfly has become my symbol of life. Just when the caterpillar thought she was dying in her cocoon, she emerged a beautiful butterfly. 
I was in a cocoon of illness and darkness. And today I stand before you and I raise my wings and I celebrate to the Lord who gave me back life. I don't know what my future plans are with the God, but as Jeremiah tells me, he's got it. So it's with my faith, it is with my Bible study, it is with my prayer, it is with my belief that I know that the Lord is walking with me on every step I take. So now when I go and I pick up my book for the year 2020 in those 365 blank pages, today I write this. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to worship with Christian sisters and brothers. And may every time a butterfly crosses our path, that we be remembered and reminded that there is a time for everything. And the Lord has us in his hands. He knows our plan for us. He gives us hope. And he gives us the future. Amen. Thank you.